All right, gentlemen, this is the episode we've been waiting for. This is the episode I know a lot of our fans have been waiting for. I mean, I feel like it's been, it's been, we've waited so long for it, but finally, like to, to engage with it, to spend time in that world, to see the world that a master, a genius has created for us, and just to share it with you. I couldn't think of a better Christmas gift. So, yeah. I mean, to spend any amount of time in the world, the, the sort of uncannily rendered, beautiful sort of science fiction reality of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Fellas, your thoughts. I mean, we like, it's just, I'm stunned. I'm stunned. I'm speechless. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, like, we all had huge expectations, right? You know, I think everyone did. Uh, just because of like the the groundbreaking work that we've seen this creator do before, and I think I kind of speak for I know I speak for myself, and I think I'll, I speak for everyone who's going to see this that our expectations could never do justice to what we actually saw. It's not just the beauty of the world and the imagination and the richness and the fullness of it, but it's also like the the promise that there are things that beautiful in the world that we live in. And that we can take some of that magic with us once we're done watching. Although I have to say, when I did finish, I was filled with a deep emptiness <laughs> when I realized that I did not live in Tulsa and that <laughs> I, I have no likelihood in the near future to visit. But you know what? It, it's you know what? It's not just it's not just the special effects, though. There's something there's something very human in this story, which suggests that all of us could be Tulsa kings or queens. You know, and look, on a previous Christmas episode, you know, we talked about the, the genius, the God, Sly Stallone and Cobra. I didn't think that Tulsa King would be better than Cobra, but holy shit, here I am having just seen the first six episodes and it was worth waiting 40 years for. I mean, I said, Sly Stallone hasn't done anything since Cobra. He's just been work he, this is, he's only been working on Tulsa King for the last 40 years. It's taken us this it's long, but we finally it's the ultimate have the passion project. Yeah. He created a uh, Tulsa dome uh, just outside <laughs> of the city where they've been working on this nonstop for decades. Did, did you know that um, Stallone actually worked with linguists from MIT and Harvard to create a new language that we hear and speak <laughs> in this in this uh, Paramount Plus series? <laughs> it actually sounds like a and system like, okay. of mumbles and conjunctions, but it's a totally new language he invented. Um, yeah, and like, you know, it's just the, the, uni the, the universe that he created in this, the universe of Tulsa is so vividly rendered that people think Tulsa is a real place. Mm -hmm. They think it's a real city. There's people who want to visit Tulsa after seeing Tulsa King. And you just got to say like, no, it's, it's only the product. It's just the product of the imagineers that created this fictional environment for Stallone to, to live and prosper in and for all of us to imbibe his lessons. But if we do that, then we can make Tulsa real. I really do believe that. I believe we can all realize that we all live in Tulsa it, and we can live in Tulsa if we if we all want it. Yeah, no, no, uh, Matt, you're exactly right. I actually I went to a talk by uh, Mr. Stallone, and that is pretty much exactly what he said. That like, even if you're not like literally a 75 year old mobster who just got out of prison, yet who is curiously able to beat up everyone that he meets, <laughs> and you know despite being 75 and five foot four and mostly scar tissue, every woman he meets wants to fuck him. Even though we're not like literally that we, we can, we can sort of live that we can, we can take his lessons and we can take his way of being and be how he is to Tulsa in our, in our own environs. And I think that's amazing. Yes. I think that's a beautiful message. And you know what? And I don't want to hear any of the criticism that Stallone and Taylor Sheridan are engaging in tropes about the elderly. No, because look, this is, this is a real character. Okay. This is not just look, I know Taylor Sheridan has said some questionable things about the elderly in the past, but I look, look, look any, any offensive comparisons, I think they fall flat. This is a, this is a work that honors, respects and upholds elderly, elderly peoples the world over and their uh, folk ways, a elderly Italian people, especially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. There's always going to be, you know, 
critics of people who take on this world saying that they like don't understand the customs or like the traditions. But I mean, I just got to say that this is the reason this is the reason that we go on web based uh, C tier streaming services to see a new world. <laughs> this is this is why. This is why we watch television on streaming based at Paramount Plus. This is what Paramount Plus was created for. Exactly. It took them years to create the Paramount, the, the, the Paramount technologies necessary to render the universe of Tulsa. And man, oh man, has it paid off. So, uh, listener, you may be asking yourself now, why are we not talking about the billion dollar <laughs> movie that, <laughs> that you've been waiting for for a, for a year is for us to finally uh, see the Avatar The Way of Water and talk about the world's number one movie instead of a Paramount Plus TV series that uh, probably five people have watched? Well, look, listener, there are some complications have arisen. The gay potion that Matt dosed himself with, the dark web gay potion, Matt has had some adverse reaction to the dark web gay poison that uh, he had to had to take as a result of think, saying Herschel Walker would win the runoff election. It's true. I have been forced to stay in my home for the next week I, until I test negative for gay before I'm allowed to go into a movie theater. But as soon as I can, I promise I will go. I will I will be transported and then we can we will talk about uh Avatar. Yeah. Um we we were all responsible obviously like we all you know got tested ever since fast tested. Doctors actually said I have the most natural immunity. It's almost like I drink it every day of my life is what they said, <laughs> which I don't. I want to clarify I don't. Um but yeah, no. We we, we got to be safe. We will review this sort of like lesser not as interesting, not as exciting or creative or inventive uh, media franchise later. But, you know, we're really here. We're really here to talk about. I think I think you would call it the successor to not only Avatar, but Terminator, The Sopranos and um, let's just say Anna Karenina, too. This is a lot. Of, this <laughs> the is Bible. The Bible. Um, Revolutionary Road. The Secret. Um, the Quran. The Theravedas, or whatever the other book is called. The stuff that Buddha uh, said. By the way, I just want to correct one thing that uh, Will said. This show is not being watched by five people. It's got better ratings than House of the Dragon. Let's go. It's really? huge. A oh, better okay. world is possible. Right. Huge. I, I, okay, okay, okay. Taylor let's, let's, Sheridan <laughs> cannot be defeated. Okay. Uh, he, okay. Has, uh, he has the algorithm for the, uh, the lumpen American television viewer. No, not well, not, not what, your hipsters. Well, this wanna, is what I want to talk about. Something they can talk about on Twitter, but people who like actually sit down and watch the bulk of scripted television. He right. is their fucking oh, snake charmer, and he knows I mean, what they want. Yeah, yeah. Yellowstone. Yeah. It's is already the king been of cable renewed TV. for a second season. Uh, it's okay. So, I mean, thank God for that. I, I mean, look, I was being perhaps too dismissive of Taylor Sheridan and the Taylor Sheridan verse as well. I know Yellowstone is a huge hit. And it makes makes perfect sense that Tulsa King is also a huge hit. I meant among our listeners. <laughs> oh yeah, none of our no, none of our listeners. No, none of our <laughs> listeners watch this. None of our listeners watch this. They all watch. You, we all know what our fucking stupid fucking listeners watch. They watch some like fucking post ironic bullshit that gets released on like I don't know. You can only watch it in a laundromat. You 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 have to show proof of purchase that you bought one sandwich from an ock. At, uh, the bodega in order to watch it. They're watching whatever the fuck they're watching. I don't give a shit. Taylor Sheridan, Taylor Sheridan, as Matt has alluded to, is one of the new gods of TV. He is an immortal being yeah. more powerful than the previous great, great one, uh, Ken Olin. Ken Olin may write, you know, sentimental comedy, quasi fucking family drama fluff for the dying generation, the boomers, okay? He may be a superstar god at that. But Taylor Sheridan, he is um, he is really zeroed in on the most important new audience, people who were born around 1980. Taylor Sheridan knows their values. He knows how they want to be thought of and portrayed. Uh, all his shows, they are about sort of morally conflicted uh, so guys, guys who are rough around the edges but have a heart of gold. And this represents the viewers, people who are entering their early 40s. And 
maybe have been disinvited from several family functions for some weirdly sexual comments they've made about a younger cousin's girlfriend. <laughs> well, okay. This is all very appropriate for Taylor Sheridan, the new god of television, because do you guys recall where Taylor Sheridan got his start before he became the god of movies and television? That is right. Not as a yes. writer, director, or showrunner, but as an actor on the greatest TV series of all time, Sons of Anarchy, a show that I think honestly birthed Chapo Trap House. Like the three of us yes. basically connected with each other to talk about Sons of Anarchy and go on Street Fight and shoot the shit with the uh, B&B about our favorite TV show. Taylor Sheridan played the 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 sheriff of the, uh, the good or, cop. you know, was it uh, Redwood, California? Yeah. He got immediately murked, though. They just <laughs> yeah, he just wrote him out of the, the show halfway through the first season. He was killed season. in yeah, the se season uh, three uh, premiere, the se episode one, season three. Yeah, so he plays. So Taylor Sheridan's character in Sons of Anarchy is named David Hale. And the head of the Charming Police Department uh, is this horrible, sort of waterlogged looking man, Unsler, whose entire reason for being a cop <laughs> Charlie is Charlie Utter. Charlie Utter. He's had a crush on Gemma uh, for approximately seven, 78 years. She is a beautiful woman. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but David Hale, meanwhile, is like a real good stand-up cop, the kind of guy who rescues cats out of trees. And if he touched fentanyl, he, he can hold it out. He'll hold his breath. He'll be fine. Um, he's jacked. There is this one really, really weird scene that I can't get out of my head where Jax is on a stealth mission in the police station for so he's like stealing some documents. And then he sees, he sees Taylor Sheridan's character, David Hale, just nailing one of the deputies from behind, just fucking ball slapping on thighs, pop, pop, pop. He's just giving it to her. I don't know why they showed us that, but they did. Uh, anyway, oh, I know. I know why. Well, we all wanted to see it, obviously. But anyway, he was a good, he was he was a good. I get some poison out of my body, Felix. Well, you know, I, some say the poison is letting it out, but um, he uh, he plays a <laughs> he plays a good honest cop who obviously hates the Suns because they cause an excess of seven hundred murders a week and countless property damage in a town of three hundred people. A town of three hundred people. They can't be making more than five hundred dollars uh, a week. Uh, but then later he has to work. <laughs> He has to work with the sons because, you know, uh, the writers were like, who can we think of a, a, as a villain who's like somehow worse than the Sons of Anarchy? I know a Nazi who fucks his daughter and then he dies. <laughs> but that is not the end of Taylor Sheridan, the man. He became a god. The closest thing we have to a god, a TV showrunner. Yeah. And, and, and he really is, as Matt said, he is he is the sort of the the whisperer. Of like the 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 vastly underserved like red state America TV watching audience, which I think like I can tell why he's so successful because there's a moment in the uh, the pilot episode of Yellowstone, which was like that was his like tentpole TV property with you know Kevin Costner being ridiculous, and I believe on Yellowstone now Kevin Costner is now the Republican governor of Montana on That's that so show, stupid. which is it's great. Awesome. But it, but in the pilot episode of Yellowstone, Kevin Costner's daughter like the sort of Lady Macbeth style, sort of cold-blooded, you know, he's got, he's got a lot of like icy, cold-blooded women who are sort of very mercenary and sort of promiscuous. It's a, it's a running theme here. But uh, the Kevin Costner is uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the princess of the ranch is at a, like a, a sort of swanky hotel bar in Bozeman, Montana, which is sort of the, the, the cool college town in Montana. And a guy Bozeman at a bar answers. starts hitting on her. Yeah, I fucking hate, I hate Bozeman people so much. Uh, but there's a guy at the bar who's hitting on her. And he's like, you know, just like politely trying to buy her a drink. And then for no reason, she shuts him down by saying so, like something about like, let me guess, like, you know, uh, you moved out here from California to like live the real lifestyle. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. You look like a soft fuck. And then walks Ooh. away. And I was like, OK, yeah. I now I understand why this is the number one show on TV because nobody watching it wants to imagine that they're a soft fuck, but you better believe Kevin Costner is laying hard pipe because he's a man of the old school. And that is what Taylor Sheridan shows are all about. It's about the, the clash in values and morality between 
sort of the the Western male archetypes and what does that mean in a modern uh, sort of pussified soy world? And yeah, and, and now with Tulsa King, he adds to that mix. What happens when you take old the old school masculinity of the uh, American Northeast and the Italian uh, organ- ma- mafia and organized crime and brought it into a setting, the fictional city of Tulsa? Well, you pointed out something very important about the Taylor Sheridan verse, you know, old versus new uh, reaction versus the new world. But I think another I think the primary reason that Sheridan is so successful and his projects are so big is because his protagonists, his heroes represent uh, the viewers in that the viewers are the types of people who wear those shirts that you buy on Facebook that are like, I may be the black sheep of the family, but I'm the one you call when shit gets tough. You know? Yes. That, that's yes, that like, is every that's protagonist on one of his shows. Yeah, it's like literally, it's all for uh, people who are like, oh, I may be the worst member of this family, but I can sure get you Adderall. <laughs> that isn't really Adderall, but my friend made it. No, it's like everyone in the family may hate me, but if someone were trying to kill that family, they would call me. Yeah, it's people who I fantasize. It's people who like fantasize about their family being kidnapped so they could like save them and get invited back to Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're like the the solution to all of their uh their relationship problems is a home invasion that they get for. <laughs> yes, ex- yes. It is it's sort of like the 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 adult outgrowth of um fantasizing about stopping a school shooting so you can finally have sex when you're in high school. Well, so like, like you know, uh, so Taylor Sheridan, like uh, heretofore, his shows are sort of about the the folk ways of uh, criminals and their sort of old, old school customs and existing in the modern world. Old, like you know, the the old West meets the new West. And in this show, Tulsa King, the formula is what it, what happens when the old East meets the new West. It is a show about uh, mafia capo Dwight Manfredi, named after Dwight Eisenhower, Dwight the General Manfredi who is released from prison after serving a 25 year stretch after like, doing a murder for his like mafia family that he he's like, I kept my mouth shut. I kept my mouth shut for 25 years. Literally the years. only mob guy in history. Facing <laughs> yeah. a 25 year sentence. who didn't flip yeah. immediately. Mob, yeah. yeah mob and the show makes, will, a, makes a big deal out of that. When mob guys get pulled over, when mob guys get like moving violations, they give up the entire structure of their family. <laughs> It's amazing how little well, how little they give credit they give this guy for doing yeah something that no other mafia guy has ever done. So yeah, the, the show begins and it's it's Stallone and he's, he's it's like you know first day out the feds and you know like he uh, he's just on a twenty five year jail stretch and he's like you know uh, hoping that he's going to be like warmly embraced by his like you know the mafia family that he just sacrificed twenty a quarter century of his life for. But like, you know, like there's all this like uh, he emerges from jail. There's like a scene where he's like driving through Manhattan. He's being chauffeured through Manhattan and he's like looking with a uh, bemused puzzlement at things like uh, <laughs> the city bike, Soul Cycle, <laughs> the New World Trade Center, the Apple store. He's like, hey, what happened to the two buildings here? Yeah, that was just one building. <laughs> <laughs> and, what like, what he, happened you know, to he, the he Ground Zero Mosque? <laughs> <laughs> I, used to, I used to love to pray there. <laughs> so I received the Umar. He's got, he's got like, uh, I kept my mouth shut all these years. I married this life. Now I'm going to see if this life married me back. <laughs> and uh, wh- he gets his answer early on because he's uh, his chauffeur is, uh, he, he just sort of like cruises by scores, the famous strip club in New York. And he's like, hey, we're, we're going to go to scores. This is going to be a party. There's no, going to be not- a party for me in scores. <laughs> No, sorry, Dwight Manfredi. You're not getting a uh, a stripper party for your first day out of prison. You're going to be chauffeured to the world's ugliest mansion on Long Island to be to immediately go into the worst meeting ever with like the shittiest mafia family that's ever existed or been portrayed. Oh, on oh, oh, like just gross, <laughs> the, dude. The sons of anarchy of mob families. Will I put this in my? No- this is the first thing I wrote down in my notes, and I just wrote um, the phlegm meeting. <laughs> It's like a bo- <laughs> it's like a bohemian grove for guys who need auric vacuums to suck their mucus out. <laughs> it's like the shitty the world's shittiest mafia family, and now like uh, 
like the 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 boss who has like some you know some sort of like uh <laughs> he has sleep he has like a fucking CPAP machine he's taking hits off of and shit but like his son who was like 10 years old when uh dwight went to went to prison is now he's like hey uh, uh, Dwight, uh, uh, Cheeky's my underboss now. What do you think you can say to him? Okay, the underboss is played by uh, Dominic um, Lombardazzi. Lombardazzi, who you may remember, you know, he was he yeah. was in The Wire, you know, uh, he was uh, he was in uh, yeah, fucking The Irishman. But here's the thing. If you, if you know the guy I'm talking about, he has a very specific sort of like cue ball head. They give him the worst <laughs> wig I have ever seen. Like, why why does this character have hair? He's got a full head of hair, and it just like it's it, it's. If you're aware of this actor, it, it is like okay. If you weren't aware that he was totally bald, then you're just wondering what the fuck is on this guy's head. And then if you are aware of what this guy looks like, every time you look at him, you're just like, why the choice for this guy? Why does it's he have It's wild. Hair? It's like they just stapled a squirrel pelt to his head. <laughs> Not since Corey Stahl in The Strain. Yes. Has oh, there been so a more bald ass motherfucker inexplicably <laughs> given a terrible hairpiece? And at least on, yeah. and on that show, they gave up like halfway through the first season and had him shave his head. Matt, are we in real strain hours right now? Oh, yeah. You know, you know, we are. You know, we're, <laughs> we're in real hours. strain hours right now. Um, Felix, actually, the, the, the first note I had, because I, 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 I rewatched this for the show today, the, the only thought I had, I don't know why, and I just had this intrusive thought that the show should be called Lindy King, and the show is about a <laughs> Paul Scalise fan getting out of prison <laughs> and, like, you know, uh, trying to make his way in the 4HL and uh, fighting the 1YKAE <laughs> or something. <laughs> shout out I'm to just Paul. Thinking like, it's shout a show about Paul. a guy who's Lindy. Yeah, it's a show oh about God. a Lindy man. It's a show about a Lindy man. It is a show about a Lindy man. Well, dude, okay, because like when he went to jail, things were still Lindy, and he gets out of jail, everything is not Lindy anymore. No, no, okay, no. Shout out to Paul. A lot of people don't know this. Paul has followed me and corresponded with me because we're both fight fans since like 2013. I, I, dude, I was on the Lindy train before anyone. But, like, shout out to Paul. If you're Lindy, if you, you follow the Lindy principles, you go to prison for 25 years, you get out, you're fine. Because, okay, you're you're still only doing Lindy things. You're still only doing things the ancients did, okay? So it's not like you're, you're going to just start using an iPad now. If, you, if you're out well, there, if you're a listener, if you're going to prison for 20 years, if you did something really bad... Better start getting Lindy. <laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is, like, he goes, he goes to jail. He probably went to, he went to jail in like 1999 or something. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, right at the end of history. And then it's just like, no, like, it, he didn't go to jail in like the 1950s. You know, he gets out of jail. He's like, well, what's this noise? And it's like rap music or something. It's like, no, that existed in 19. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, they, they, they push, his his yeah, references they push are still in like far. the 1950s. He's like, hey, now this year is real music. And it's like, you know, <laughs> Dean Martin or the Stones or something. Yeah, they push it a little far. Um, like he's like he sees he sees like a woman in jeans and he's like, hey, what the fuck? Does her husband let her do that? <laughs> so for his troubles, for marrying the game, for being faithful to the game for twenty five years, what is his reward from his mafia family? They're like, hey, Dwight, you know things ain't been so good lately. You know you can't. There's not really a place for you here in New York. We got about, you know, uh, six fake jobs left. We have about six <laughs> no-show union jobs for every fucking Italian mob guy in New York left. So your reward for your years of loyalty is you get to set up a new mob franchise in the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then, like, you know, he reacts to that news by, uh, again, as a 75-year-old man, like, one-shotting this much younger man, knocking him out cold because he's got no respect got no respect he's, uh, this guy's mouth is running off got no respect he knocks there is like, he, he, so he knocks at the hey he's a capo oh but then he's like yeah okay i'll go to tulsa he doesn't put up much of a fight he's like okay the next scene he's in tulsa if there is a character that this literally on screen 75 year old man cannot beat up we have not met him <laughs> like he he is so, a force yeah, he's he a you know he's an old he's an old school guy and like the point is that even the mob isn't Lindy anymore, you know. Like they're mm -hmm. they're, they're they they got fucking uh, Fitbits and fucking. <laughs> they've gone woke. Uh, they've yeah, gone woke, folks. They've got yeah. They've got the woke mind virus now. Yeah. Why? Yeah. You know, why did um, the mafia so yeah. go woke? They went broke. <laughs> so 
he decamps from uh, Long Island to the you know the the middle of the Great Plains of America in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So it's a it's a real fish out of water story. He uh, arrives at the airport and like a like a cricket jumps on him and he's like, oh, what the what the hell is that? And like some nice lady is like, oh, it's just a it's June bug. And he goes, that's bigger than my cock. And then she spritzes him with holy water and he's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot of my Stallone voice on this show. It's so hard not to do. He, uh, he, <laughs> he gets spritzed with holy water and then meets like, and then it meets like the second lead on the show. Uh, the first black guy who hasn't been trying to stab him for the last, tw- the, guy, the first black guy he's met in 25 years who hasn't been trying to kill him. And he's just like, oh, okay. why don't you take me to, take me to a hotel? And like he immediately befriends this like younger, cool black guy and hires him as his chauffeur. This scene is awesome. Like, I mean, how could it not be? But it, it, it's like every every bit of like bad racial buddy comedy. I, I guess <laughs> if you wrote if you if you went to prison for 25 years and this was the last scene you wrote before you went in, it would make a lot of sense <laughs> because it'll be like it, it'll be shit like uh, Sloan will be like, hey, just take me to the best place in town. And um, the black guy goes. Oh, so you're a gangster. And he goes, I'm not a gangster. You can't go around calling everybody a gangster. And the guy goes, no, gangster means cool. Like, gangster is just what just what I say. And Sloan goes, you got to check your fucking grammar, which I also made a note of. Because, like, if anyone is having trouble with grammar, it's, it's not him. It's perhaps the most inaudible man who's ever lived. <laughs> so it's like I mean like his his mafia family they were just like yeah here's a play like or don't even like you buy your own plane ticket to Tulsa nothing is set up there but they're like yeah you gotta kick five thousand dollars a week back to us it's like what like what is he gonna do there just see the fucking sights well no not Dwight the general Manfredi the first thing he does even before he goes to a hotel is he uh, comes across a legal marijuana dispensary now this becomes a major part of the plot and it introduces our third lead, played by Martin Starr from Party Down and other various comedies. The you know sort of like as the stand-in for the kind of the new world uh, millennial sort of like nerd stoner kind of like a guy who could not be more different. Like the the world in his frame of reference could not be more different than Stallone. So here's a question that I had: uh, This is a legal business. This is a legal marijuana dispensary. <laughs> And, and 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 Stallone immediately just starts extorting him for protection money. But like from who? It's legal. <laughs> the way like the, goes, way he he explains, the, like, the way he explains okay, like, the way the writing the gangs. of the show and he goes what gangs? The he, <laughs> the, the That's the that, thing is like the show doesn't even give a justification. Like he doesn't even give one, and it's like that's fine. He's a dumb you know mook or whatever. But the guy just gives him the money and then does not call the cops. Sorry, my cat was acting a fool. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, so like, he's just like the the way he the way he ex- like the way you the, the way I was this was explained to me the viewer I was watching like how are you as a member of organized crime able to like extort a legal drug business for protection when they can just call the cops and be like hey there's this Italian asshole who's trying to take me down <laughs> for money and they'd be like well yeah obviously you're you're a licensed vendor so he just the way he explains it to Martin Starr's character. Is that hey look you may got a lot of money in the safe but like the feds could take it away from you at any minute. I guess so, he, like, was he just reading... has like a half million dollars in cash in a safe, but he's like hey you know you gotta gotta start laundering that. So he's like he was not committing crimes before he met this guy, and then now he's in a, involved in a money laundering operation with this dude to to wash his money that like apparently the feds can just take because it's still illegal at a federal level. I don't know. It did not make much sense to me. But you, it has an opportunity for a lot of wonderful bands between Sly and Martin Starr. What a mismatched comic duo they make. I will say Martin Starr, uh, a Chapo all-star, just uh, one of the greats, amazing on Party Down, one of the funniest characters. Um, but yeah, this is <laughs> the laundering money thing, as you have pointed out, raises many more questions than it answers. Um do we think that when Stallone's character was in prison, he was reading intercept articles about Jeff Sessions' <laughs> DOJ doing civil forfeiture <laughs> dispensaries in red states? I don't know. Hard also, to say. 
You know what would really get the FBI more likely to uh, seize your uh, assets if you're uh, colluding with a fucking uh, uh, convicted mafia guy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess like, yeah, like maybe the feds could steal all your, your legal marijuana cash. But like it just it still doesn't make any sense why Martin Starr's character just like acquiesces to this ongoing business relationship. Because he's a fucking millennial <laughs> bitch. That's yes. why. Yeah. Well, the show goes to great lengths. And I actually really like the way the show goes to great lengths to be like, actually, Martin Starr really did need the, the partnership and help of an experienced Italian American gentleman who has, uh, you know, work experience in the crime related fields. Like when they go into their next big business, you want to talk about sons of anarchy, low sons of anarchy style, low rent crimes. Uh, another big part of the show is, uh, cornering the nitrous oxide market at festivals in Oklahoma. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh my God. That has to be dozens this, this of dollars big, a week he, he in has, profit. He has a legal weed dispensary, which probably prints like a hundred grand in profit, like a week or something like that. And then they're like, Hey, our next big move, we're going to sell this gas. It's, we're going to sell this laughing gas to people at the circus. You say that, you say, oh, how could that be a, such a big deal? But it's apparently a big enough deal that the, it immediately puts them in violent confrontation with a mo uh, 1% motorcycle gang who is uh, also way, selling nitrous at the festivals. <laughs> the name of the bad biker gang in this show is literally Black Adam. I mean, oh the name of the show is, is Black Mick Adam is the name. Black Mick Adam is the name of the one percenter motorcycle gang that he runs afoul of. But every time I just mm -hmm. think of Black Adam is the name of the bad guys on this show. Uh, so I, I like the idea. Just rewinding a little bit to the money laundering. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess there could be jurisdictional fights over legal marijuana, um, typically not under a Democratic president. But I mean, whether it's fully legal or fully illegal, that is Sylvester Stallone is the last guy I would want setting up my money laundering operation. Does that seem like it would have been his specialty in the mob? <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things in the early episodes that's a recurring plot is him trying to get a fucking debit card. Yeah. <laughs> there are multiple scenes of his trying to get some sort of credit or debit card and failing. Like, yeah, yeah. His money laundering thing, his money laundering scheme for this business. It's like, yeah, clearing like 100 K a week in debt income would be what he's going to be like, Oh, uh, we're selling CDs. All these kids <laughs> love listening to music. We're selling a hundred grand worth of CDs every week. <laughs> I got these old Rosemary Clooney records. We're going to launder money. through them. <laughs> <laughs> another, another, another great part about the scene where he first um, begins extorting the marijuana dispensary is Martin Starr's employees include a white guy with dreads who's like, whoa, whoa, man, you're freaking me out. And then like a really high uh, white girl, probably also with dreads and like a nose piercing, who's like, when he accosts them, she's like, like I I'm, I'm really triggered right now. And he's like, well, what's trigger? What's, what's the trigger? What's that? Oh, yeah. There's, so there's a lot, so of, good, lot, of, good, lot of good so millennial. Much good shit. Uh, uh, <laughs> There's so much good millennial stuff on this show. Yeah, Sylvester Stallone, in case you were worried that he just lets wokeism happen around him, he does not. Oh, uh -uh. No, no, he does not. <laughs> not on Dwight the General Man Freddy's watch, I'll tell you that. Dude, Dwight, Dwight the General Man <laughs> Freddy, um, fire Christopher Rufo, who bricked the midterms. He sucks. <laughs> Hire Dwight the General Man <laughs> Freddy. He killed it. Dude, okay. he, what do you heard about pronouns? I want to jump ahead to... <laughs> I want to jump ahead to the scene in episode two that involves him and Martin Starr going to see like the people who grow all the weed that Martin Starr sells. It's like on an Indian reservation. It's like they had like, and you know, he, he uses his mafia business genius skills to like negotiate a better deal that this guy probably didn't even need to begin with. But because they're on a weed farm, he's eating like, you know, uh, apricot preserves or something. And the guy, like the head dude in charge of it is like, just so you know, those are infused raspberry preserves or whatever. And it's like, infused with what? And he's like, well, you're on a marijuana farm. So, like, he's just been dosing himself with weed. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, I wonder why I feel so good right now. <laughs> and then he's like, <clears throat> they're in the car driving back. And he's like, it's Sly smoking a joint, which, like, honestly, I really appreciated because, like, I always think of Stallone as such a, you know, kind of like throwback old school guy. You know, he's like some, something of a reactionary. So it was good to see a Stallone character, you know, just chill out and smoke a dupe. But of course, he gets high, and the bullshit he starts talking about is like, I gotta ask you a question. 
like what's what's going on in this country right now? Like your generation, like what's going on with all these pronouns? <laughs> I feel like Rip Van Winkle. You wake up after 25 years, GM has gone electric, Dylan's gone public, a phone, there's a camera, come on, and these pronouns. What the fuck is with the pronouns? He, she, him, they, the, boom, bang, ba, bang, cool. You know what my pronoun is? Guess. Um, Time's up. Okay. It, as in it, can't take this shit anymore. <laughs> That amazing, amazing. That's probably my favorite scene on television that I've seen this entire year of watching TV. I would say in my lifetime. Well, I, I love this scene <laughs> for so many reasons. Um, primarily among them that he like just names like no, like pronouns that everyone has always said. Like he, yeah. he, he what the, the fuck pronouns is like he, him and her. What the hell's a he? It's like, it's like he, what the fuck's a yeah, he? It's like he's not even mad at the concept of like neo pronouns or like stating your pronouns. He's just mad at like the idea of using pronouns, of referring to yourself. Yeah, like that article of speech. Yeah, it's pissing yeah, him off. Unless you're referring to yourself or others by their proper noun, by their full name at all times, don't talk about them. Also, also, no, I, I feel like that, that his his pro like that's a classic conservative joke. Like, yo, my pronouns are "Let's go, Brandon" or whatever. But like, my pronoun is "it." I can't take this shit. <laughs> that's, that's, Just boggles the mind. It's so good. He's awesome. So good. He's like, call me, call me it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone is uh he's 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 it okay <laughs> we should respect that but I feel like going back to something you said I I totally agree with you Christopher Rufo lives of TikTok huge fucking losers Brick. get get the white man Freedy get Frank Stallone and of Sly get Frank and Sly Stallone put them in charge of Republican messaging they'll sort out these gender youths and the teachers they would not have like lost the Senate. That that would not have happened to them. Christopher Rufo is a loser. Lives of TikTok loser. If you stuck either of them in Oklahoma, they would not. They're definitely not becoming the kings or queens of Tulsa. I'll tell you that much. Not in the least. No way. Maybe maybe the, maybe the Tulsa jester. That's the most they can hope for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, going back to the first episode, he then meets like it's just sort of like he he slowly but surely puts together his own ragtag crew out in Tulsa of, you know, people that you wouldn't think would be involved in a mafia enterprise, but you know what? He makes it work. They're sort of like the gang that couldn't shoot straight a little bit, a little bit, a little bit outside. That's he's coloring a little bit outside the lines. Uh, <laughs> well, for a mafia guy, a that he's like employing a black guy at all. <laughs> let alone yeah. trusting him with a uh, business or anything like that. So like the, the fourth member of the crew that he meets is a bartender at a cowboy bar played by uh, Garrett Headland, who you may remember from inside Lewin Davis. He's a uh, sort of John Goodman's chaperone. He also played Neil Cassidy in the on the road movie movie. He, he, was, a, like, he was a failed hunk. He was, he's one yeah. of the many attempts <laughs> he's to one do of the a younger hunks. movie star that failed because we don't, that the, the, the conditions are no longer applicable. So he had to end up going back to TV. Yeah. The economics for know, hunks uh, post Bush administration really are tough. Yeah. But you know, good, good to see Garrett in a TV show. Um, but you know, he's an ex con too. He's done some time and you know, he, he <laughs> I tell you like the name of the bar that he runs is called bread to buck. He, he runs the buck breaking. Bar. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's a professional buck break. <laughs> <laughs> all, and, the, all the barbacks have to just find new skirts to put black guys in <laughs> but uh at the bread to buck bar uh, at, the, at the breeding club uh, <laughs> he beats the love interest to the show now felix i'm interested to see if you clock this do you recognize the sly stallone love interest from another tv show that i know you're a fan of wait no wait who is she? okay who is she she was a character on Veep. She was not in the main cast. She was a recurring character. She was Selena's college friend who comes in to consult for them but never does anything. Oh, my God. She the one who just rephrases. Everything they say. Yeah. yeah. She just rephrases everything they say back to them. A very funny character. And I really like seeing her on this show as well. But I was like. She's awesome. I was like, where have I seen this woman before? But, yeah, no, she was on Veep. That was her other big TV credit uh, before Tulsa King. Yeah, she is. the. I don't think that's her, though. If you're talking about the ATF agent, 
she was on Veep, but she was the Republican vice president who becomes president after the 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 botched election. Oh, okay. Well, the okay. the the, the fake I'm, I'm Latina gonna... is she the fake? Yeah, the fake Latina. She's the fake right. Latina. Hold on. All right, now I need to look this up. All right. Yeah, Andrea Savage. She plays Laura Montez. Yeah. All right, I was wrong. I, I was wrong. That is Laura Montez. Good call. Yeah. She okay. was a Republican government, uh, vice president. Well, that was a funny character, too. Yeah. Not as funny as the other one that I thought we she don't, was. Yeah. <laughs> Probably because I like that character so much. And I'm just, I'm rooting for all my V-Peds, and I'm rooting for everyone on Tulsa King now. So uh, he encounters her, uh, who's there for her friend's bachelorette party, and like one of the drunk bitches he's with sidles up to Dwight, and he's like, are you famous? <laughs> I he's love like, this scene. If you, lady, lady, if you got to ask if someone's famous, they're not famous. And then she's like, uh, can I take a picture? Can I take a selfie with you? And she's like, listen, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't like having my photograph taken. I love So he's like, scene. once again, combat, combating millennial culture. And then uh, the love interest comes over and she's like, hey, why are you mean to my friend? And she's like, well, you know, you, you, uh, if you'd been a little nicer, we would have invited you to the party. And he's like, party? This don't seem like a party. And then she's like, okay, what's your idea of a party? And then the next scene is that he's taken the bachelorette party to a strip club. And he's showing these gals a good old school time. That's what, lady, that's what all ladies want to do is go to a CD strip club in Tulsa for their bachelorette with party. A 75 with a 75-year-old man. Gen- <laughs> so well, here's the funny part. He then takes her home and they have sex. And then the woman is horrified to find out that he's 75 years old. And I was like, lady. Unrealistic. Uh, do you have eyes? <laughs> yeah. That is the most, I'm sorry. That is the most unreal. That is the most unrealistic thing in this entire show. I could buy anything else except for like a millennial or younger woman being like, ew, a 75 year old. That is the opposite. <laughs> that is the opposite of reality. <laughs> like if you, if you, uh, all yeah. women eventually marry their grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> if you want, like, you know what, you know what makes uh, you know, any woman horny fellas out there? Our listeners are, you know, they're millennials. They're, they're creeping up there. They, they, they you've long passed 30. It's uh, it's time for you to uh, learn a few tricks of the trade. Tell that girl you're casually seeing that you're experiencing hip problems. Really play <laughs> off the angle. <laughs> Girls around 25 love it when a man is old. And I guarantee you, if he had told her in real life, if that really happened, the equivalent of that situation, he says, oh, I'm 75. She would have squirted with such a force that would, it would have destroyed the hotel. Hey, uh, Dwight, the General Manfredi, it would have been like the Normandy landing all over again, how wet she was getting. <laughs> yes. Uh, so she's horrified to find out that the guy she just fucked was a high school senior when Kennedy was assassinated. <laughs> but uh, that, but that's all, not, not all is done with this character because the next day we find out that, as Matt already alluded to, she's an ATF agent. Oh. And then in, like, in her morning meeting, they're like, hey, guys, uh, just something to be on the lookout for. FBI has uh, just uh, tapped our shoulder and let us know that a well-known mafia associate has just come into town. And so if any of you have had sex with him in the last 24 <laughs> hours, now is the time to say so. Yeah. They're sitting so around. They're like, sitting. Oh, fuck me. Yeah. They're sitting around the office Keurig and they're like, so has anyone like fucked any criminals by mistake recently? Um. So like yeah, basically that's that's the end of episode one. Now I'd, I'd like to I'd like to uh, now spend like the rest of the, just talk about some highlights from uh, we we we've, we've done a good guys good job setting up the pilot and the concept of the show. But you know the the show's still ongoing. It's in its sixth episode. But uh, what are some what are some other highlights from the the next couple episodes? Because there's some I already alluded to, to the pronoun conversation in episode two, which like I said is probably the funnest moment I've had watching television all year. Um, but there's a point uh, I want to One of the get favorites for me is so, yeah, Dwight decides, hey, we're going to make some money selling nitrous to these kids at this music festival where they run afoul of the 1% bikers who are already there. Uh, and their leader is, of course, a scary uh, Northern Irish guy because that's that uh, Kurt Sutter DNA infused in here that you can't get out. Yeah. Uh, and then they, those, uh, the, Bikers, of course, end up beating the hell out of his his soft out of Martin millennial Star. Uh, yeah. minions. Poor Martin Star. Uh, and then they go to M- Dwight and they're like, what do we do? Oh, my God. Like this guy's 
And he's like, you guys ever read Sun Tzu's Art of War? <laughs> yes, yes, we, yes, we, yes. We yes. Don't, you don't got to fight sometimes. You just, you do strategy. You got to think. <laughs> and then the plan that he comes up with is they just go to where the bikers are, get a bunch of baseball bats and just beat them up. Yep. That, Which that, they that, handily do. They successfully <laughs> beat the shit out of a larger number of motorcycle uh, uh, criminals. It led by 75 year old Sylvester Sloan, who, of course, knocks everybody the fuck out. And when he, say, he says so, they're like, uh, so like they're, they're, uh, cause they're, they're at the fairgrounds. And then like Martin Starr or whatever is just like, OK, what does Sun Tzu say we should do now? And then Sloan goes in the auto war. Sun Tzu says at some point in his life, every man's got to grow a set of balls. And then he just pops <laughs> up in the trunk and there's like 15 baseball bats in there. So I was like, what happened to the greatest victories are achieved without violence? And it's like, okay, sometimes the greatest victories are achieved without violence. Other times they are achieved with violence though. So that's what we're doing now. <laughs> so, but okay, Matt, the, the other, okay, what, the whole Sun Tzu narrative made me think of Brian Quimby so much because this was like a perfect like Brian Quimby like I, I just felt like this was so much in his wheelhouse. I told him to watch this show, but like explicitly like the perfect dumb guy thing of referencing the art of war and then doing the exact opposite of what that quote is supposed to import. <laughs> then uh, there's one more element to the the rum the nitrous oxide baseball bat art of war rumble that I thought really that we really must comment on. It's that he employs his chauffeur's dad to come along and, and, and do an act of gang violence with his son to sort of reunite them. Because, like, the dad is worried that, like, son, you're better than this. You need to go back to college. You don't need to be working for this criminal. And he's like, dad, I'm my own man. I can do what I want. And then Stallone just sort of meets the dad and is like, hey, you want to come beat up some bikers with us? And he's like, all right, I'll help my son. <laughs> so it's Look, like, my son's going to go out beating bikers. I want to go out and beat up bikers with him. You know, it's like how you want to you want your kids to drink in your house so they don't get into trouble. Yeah, they really um, that was a conflict. They pretty quickly scrapped um, my uh, one of my highlights. It's a it's a darker scene, but uh, or set of scenes. But it it, it it is so insane that I still want to mention it. So obviously, like every single character of his type every character like this where it's like a, a wizened old tough guy he has a daughter who doesn't like him every character like that has yep. one of those right yep sylvester sloan's character obviously he's got one of those so there's this revelation that she was raped by like one of his associates but the way that they like reveal this is so insane oh that, my that god they, yeah they, <laughs> Basically, she's like, um, you know, you don't, you, you don't give a shit. You're never around, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he goes, oh, I don't know. what are you talking about? And she's like, well, like, well, one of your associates, he did something. Never mind. And he goes, what did one of my associates do to you? <laughs> and, he, and she goes, let's just say he showed me why they call him the package. Which is oh. like, it's like dialogue. It's like dialogue from a, a, a fucking porno used to describe this character's rape. It's insane. Just out of this world. I, I don't know how that made it in. But this is like, I, I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite moment, though. This is just. This is really the successor to Sons of Anarchy more than any, more than even the Mayans, which I love. Okay. Taylor Sheridan, if you're listening to the show, if, if people are connected to the Taylor Sheridan verse, what would it take? Okay. You already said Tulsa King season two, already been greenlit. It's a big hit. What would it take to incorporate Kurt Sutter as an actor onto Tulsa King? What oh would it God. take oh, for him baby. to reprise his Armenian hitman <laughs> character from The Shield, but he's in Tulsa? And also for Kurt Sutter to do his uh, director's trademark of having a limb cut off, being given AIDS, uh, being given hepatitis, <laughs> losing an eye, having his oh, bone no, no, cut no. out, yeah. uh, being cuckolded, uh, <laughs> being like having an Amazon Alexa shoved up his ass and uh, having the Alexa <laughs> recite all the most traumatic memories of his life. Uh, just all these things. That like, Kurt maybe, Sutter, maybe, there's so many maybe, things that he could do. Like he could, they could have him get fed into an industrial meat pr meat grinder or something. Yeah, maybe Let's Dwight could like uh, reminisce about his time in jail 
And Kurt Sutter could reply in flashbacks, reprise the role of Otto from Sons of Anarchy, like you said. And Dwight could just be like, I'm going to throw you something, Bodie. I'll be talking like Martin Starr, one of the millennials. You think you got a rough today with all these pronouns and going to work? <laughs> Let me tell you about the most raped man I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell you about the most yeah. tortured <laughs> raped man I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, he go, yeah, he goes up to the black guy and he's like, who's the most raped guy you know? And he's like, what? <laughs> I don't know anyone like that. He's like, well, that's right. Because you never met anyone who got raped as many as my friend, Otto. You know why he got <laughs> raped? Because he believed in something. Because <laughs> he had Anna. <laughs> that yeah, I would love to see Kurt Sutter in it. Um, I but for the, I mean, mostly though, I really do just trust Taylor Sheridan's instincts. Like he he is he is keyed in to the uh the sort of uh, for the people in the audience who have played the game Deus Ex when you link into cybernetic human consciousness. Uh, Taylor Sheridan is that, but with the, uh, cybernetic unit consciousness of TV, he understands it in a deep way that I don't think anyone else quite does. Ken Olin gets a little bit because Ken Olin knows so many evil, you know, heartstring tugging tricks, but Taylor Sheridan, I have to say he's using his powers for good. You can tell that with the, the daughter subplot. So she admits this, uh, that she'd been assaulted by one of his associates when he was in prison. And she says, don't do anything about it. You know, I've, I've, I've gone, I've moved on and all that. And of course, an opportunity for Dwight to show some growth and like respect his daughter's wishes. Uh, no, he immediately goes, <laughs> finds the guy and beats him to death in yeah. front of all the other mafia guys. And then he stomps he his face open. And then he immediately goes directly from doing a, a murder right back to his daughter, probably 15 minutes after they had this conversation. And she's yep. like, dad, did you murder the guy who raped me? And he's like, yeah, I did. What do you want from me? He's like, I told you not to though. He's, he's got blood dripping off of his fucking hands from beating this guy to death. And he's like, I he's didn't like, do, I did it for you. That's what I did it for the honor. That's why Taylor Sheridan is such a fucking genius though. Because like the 48 year olds who were watching this and there are millions of them. This is like, yeah. This is the big. This is going to be the biggest show on TV. That is like they get to watch that scene, and it replaces the real reason in their brains why their daughters don't talk to them. Like they see that, and they're like, they're like, oh, oh, that's actually what happened. Like, oh, I, I actually did that, and that's like why she didn't come home for Christmas, not because of like something insane I said or did. <laughs> I just like love her. Yeah, not much. because of what I the fucking the the genocidal. Uh, minions memes I keep posting on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not because I told her that like Taylor Swift got executed and Gitmo for being a pedophile. <laughs> I got to ask you guys, literally your generation, this country, honestly, what the fuck is going on with all these minions? <laughs> everywhere I look, there's a fucking minion everywhere. So uh, some other, uh, some other good, like sort of uh, um, uh, millennial uh, Lindy versus new uh, culture class is him discovering like uh, coffee shops Ooh. And then he's like, "Hey, can I can I just get can I just get this espresso in like a cup, like a not like a normal cup?" <laughs> and like you know, the 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 blue hair behind the counter is just like, "I think it's really cool that you're that you're green, but like we only use recycled paper here, you know. But if you want to bring your own metal cup, that's fine." And, he's just, and then and then he brings his own espresso cup to like a Starbucks and pours the espresso in a little a little porcelain espresso. Have, a, have his little have his little cafe. That that is. What's so great about this show is like they do like they do a bunch of stuff that's like well tread, right? Where like an older, like badass character rages against the modern. Like, you know, since for, we've been seeing the coffee trope for over 30 years now. I mean, we, we famously yeah. referenced the I want some coffee flavored coffee. OK, exactly. We, we've referenced the all time great Dennis Leary bit that was literally <laughs> from over 30 years ago. But there's just like a, a, a certain panache that uh, Sheridan and Stallone bring to it. It makes it feel new. They, they really take a bunch of angles that no one else would take. And the fact that it's it's not Dennis Leary or it's not like, I don't know, Clint, that it is this, um, I would say, probably the most confusing physiology a 75-year-old has ever had. <laughs> it really just adds so much to it. Just a terrific show. I mean, look, 
I'm sure I'm sure a few uh, an unfortunate few thousand of you uh, have the grave dishonor of having to go home to the holiday go home for the holidays to Missouri or one of those places. Well, why don't you watch this show with your parents? They may have their values, but you will still love it. It's a little family bonding. Well, fun experience. for the whole family. Yes. Uh, yeah. one, one more one more scene and character that I'd like to bring up is that uh, one of the guys that he adds to his crew is like uh, a former New York mob guy who's like hiding, been hiding out in Oklahoma for like 20 or 30 years, like about the same amount of time since Dwight's been gone. He's like he's lit out and he's like not witness protection, but he just like fled the mafia and is now working on like a, a, a horse farm in Oklahoma for some rich lady <laughs> uh, played by a. Uh, Max Casella, who was also in Inside Lewin Davis, and he was also on The Sopranos. He's the dude that Artie Bucco beats up, who's like fucking his hostess or whatever. He was one of Tony's Benny flunkies Fazio. on The Sopranos. Yeah, yeah. And he's on this show, and like he sees Stallone in a mall and immediately thinks that like he's been sent to Oklahoma to kill him, right? To assassinate him for, you know, breaking his breaking Omuerta and leaving this thing of ours. And then there's a hilarious scene where he takes it upon himself to strike first and attempts to kill Sylvester Stallone while he's taking his driver's ed exam and nearly domes the driver's ed teacher leading to like a fucking car chase where like the his driver's ed instructor is like in the passenger seat the whole time. I think I'm dying. You're not dying. If you were dying, you'd already be dead. That was, The driver's ed scene is great. And, uh, you know, frankly, as a, uh, Someone who will one day be taking driver's head again gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. When I, no, when yeah, I exactly yeah. like you keep your, keep, keep your cool, check your mirrors and, you know, don't get shot in the head. But you no, know, it's yeah. like basically he, uh, despite the fact that this guy uh, nearly murdered him, he's sort of, he's just like, Hey, you work for me now. And then he's part of the crew and you know what? He loves it. He's having fun again. He's, he's fighting bikers, hitting them with baseball bats. He beats up the guy whose dog keeps shitting on his lawn. It's like, you know, he, he, he's, he's forgotten what it's like to be Lindy. And now that Stallone's in town, he can be, he can be in an organized, he can be in a gang again. And that's what this show's about. It's like, you know, in this modern world, in, in, in this world that's, uh, you know, lost, lost sight of things like honor and tradition, people have lost sight of being in gangs. Yeah, They've I mean, that's what the, social atomization does. You get rid of gangs, bowling leagues, all this stuff. So like, this is, you know, We've been we've been making fun of this show that like it's that this show is an, a, an assault on you know the woke mind virus and millennial culture, but really what it is it's about chosen family. It's about the gang that you choose rather than the one you're born into. Yeah, no, and I don't think I really don't think so much that it's like an attack on millennial culture because like what I see the show as at the end of the day is that like okay, there's this tragedy. That there really like isn't a mafia in America anymore. We've talked about it a bunch, how sad it is, mm -hmm. how good it would be for there to be a mafia, how many activities they would provide for people, how it was just nice to have them around, you know? But um, it shows that even if you are a millennial, even if you are clinically libtarded, as as you know, I am, as you are, as we all are, you can still start your own mafia in Tulsa. You need it. It's true. Yeah. There's still, there's a frontier out there. There's places where they don't know nothing about protection rackets and you can just walk in and get some clueless guy to just give you money out of his safe. Yeah. And, and, and the, the young millennials, sure. They could not start their own mafia, but at the same time, the experienced copper regime, Dw Dwight Manfredi, he could not have his own mafia just as an Island. He needs them. We need community. We need to work yeah. together. The old and the young, we can both learn from each other. And together, we can recreate the fun of the old mafia, even with pronouns, e even 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 with cell phones, even with girls wearing jeans. It's like, look, Stallone, Dwight Manfredi, he needs to be taught about things like Uber and having a driver's license <laughs> and paying taxes. <laughs> but then, like, you know, Martin Starr and, like, the chauffeur character, they need to be taught about things like, yeah, um, doing murders on the orders of old men. Um, running protection rackets, um, do, doing racketeering, you know, just classic stuff like that that they don't teach anymore because they're, <laughs> they're teaching the 1619 project in schools and not how to run uh, a book, how to take that, how to, what, what a spread is and how to, <laughs> how to get money out of uh, degenerate gamblers. Tulsa is in your hearts if you want it. That's, yes. that's the message of this show. Yeah. Look, 
I know I say it all the time, but TV is back. And boy, howdy, it did never go away. Uh, I think, I think you know, I think Tulsa Kings is about halfway through this season. Um, it, we'll, we'll, I think we'll have to come back for the, you know, like a, a season wrap up. Maybe we have some, have some guests, you know, because, you know, this show, it's, it's given me that Sons of Anarchy magic. It's given me that feeling for a bad TV is good TV. Good TV is bad. Good the TV best, is yeah. bad. I like, like, look, man, I, I fucking love, like, actually good TV. I know. Make fun of Prestige TV. The White Lotus, I fucking, I think it's amazing. I love it. I, I've, I've endlessly sung its praises. Mad Men, love it. Sopranos. You, you, you've heard me say everything about it. But also, this type of TV needs to exist, too. And it's great in its own way. And also, this is my final plea. Taylor Sheridan, please hire all three of us. We would do nothing but yes, add to your yes. vision. That would, you, oh my God. You know, you want someone we to know punch the millennial uh, scumbags that you're trying yeah, to own. Yeah. We can if make you want, the, if you, the owning of richer and more punch up the Martin Starr character, just get our numbers, please. Yeah. I, oh God, I, I cannot think of a more fun job than like writing for Tulsa oh, yeah. King. We would be so good at it too. You know the um, you know the fake prestige show that I that I made up, the Frozen Garden. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I, I was like just trying to come up with like a fake, like a fake, like sort of sub prestige show that would be on AMC, like something that they would try, where they're trying to like recapture the Breaking Bad magic, but it's like not as good of a cast or writers, and it's called the Frozen Garden. And it's about a detective who hurt his knee while playing like college hockey. So he had to become a detective and he has to solve his stepdaughter's <laughs> murder. And he has a pill problem. <laughs> Taylor Sheridan, please right. let us write the frozen garden. All right. Here's, here's my, here's my writing packet. I'm going to submit this to uh, Taylor Sheridan right now. Uh, a potential future plot line on Tulsa King. Okay. Like how do we, how do we deal with Dwight in this modern world of apps and things like that and opportunities for crime there within? So he discovers the app Grinder, the gay hookup app, <laughs> and he gets on the gay hookup app and arranges dates with gay men. And when they show up expecting some dick from, you know, a 75 year old daddy with big muscles, <laughs> he then extorts them for being gay, even though it's totally normal and OK to be gay. So he shows up for the date and like maybe uh, he has sex with them, but then takes photos and he's like, hey, you want your wife finding out about this? And he's like, oh, dude, I'm, I'm gay. And I'm not I'm not. And, and he's like, OK, how about your job? And like, they're like, yeah, I. I own my own business. This is, it's an okay. You don't have to be, you have to be blackmailed by this, but then of course all of them will end up being blackmailed by him anyway. Cause they'll just give over money. Cause <laughs> yeah. they don't know what to do. They don't, they don't know how to handle a guy like him. He, so he okay. starts extorting openly gay men for being gay. Ooh. Okay. That's, that's, <laughs> it makes as much sense as, as uh, doing a protection racket on a legal business uh, with no like organized crime anywhere around to threaten them. Okay. How about this? Um, and seven, so Martin Starr, he goes to see an unnamed uh, live podcast show. Um, I'm not writing in cameos <laughs> for ourselves, but if Mr. Sheridan, you see that fit, uh, we would be honored. And uh, so he, he goes there. There's a DSA table and he sees a cute girl. <laughs> she's got a uh, she's got a Monroe piercing because it's Tulsa and they still think that's cool there. Uh, and he's like, ah, I just, uh, I really want her, but I don't know what to do. And, uh, Dwight is there, obviously he's not paying attention to all that. He notices like all the different types of pride flags, right? And he's like, wait a minute. I got an idea. And his new racket that his ragtag gang comes up with is that they're going to make pride flags with increasingly made up stripes to represent things that like aren't on other pride flags. And if you don't, oh, if so you, don't, have, you the, don't have the new flags with stripes, yeah. on it, then they can extort you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like if you like, he'll, he, Oh, Oh, like your flag doesn't have people who are in federal prison for Rico charges. You're, <laughs> you're not a real ally. Like that. I think that would be a great storyline. We could introduce the DSA girls, a character, but then have it so that the DSA girl is actually a mafia mole sent to spy on Dwight. Ah. But then she really falls in love with Martin Starr. I couldn't help but like, noticing that your pride flag doesn't represent arrow ace peoples, and it would just be a shame <laughs> if something happened to you. It would be, be a shame if you were excluding asexual people from pride. You do a lot of thinking when you're in the can. About 10 years <laughs> in, I realized I'm panned. 
<laughs> or no, he would, he would, he would, he would, he would say, he would say something like, "I realize that pan ain't just something that you put your mozzarella in." <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay, this this writes itself. Okay, uh, please hire us. Yeah, no, no. Okay, so no, he discovers that Martin Starr is in a poly relationship. It'll be like. What the fuck? Back in my day, I used to just, I used to just, I used to just give my gumad and all the, the old brajol on a Saturday. Oh my god! Yeah, then he real, then they realize that like the gumas, the open guma system is really just poly. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, and it's just like you know a beautiful linking of uh, past and present. Man, you know, maybe you know, this uh, <laughs> makes more sense. I didn't know. You know. <laughs> I've been in a poly relationship this whole time. Oh, uh, you know, at the Copa, Saturdays were for your primary partners, but Fridays are always for the thirds and unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got this secret document. It's a list of all the shittiest men in Tulsa media. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this, this, this show writes itself. God damn it. Oh, uh, we, we, so many good stuff. So, uh, please hire us. There we go. That's, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's Lindy King. That's, that's our, <laughs> uh, su- our submission to Taylor Sheridan to hire the three of us as actors, writers, showrunners. You know, look, I can do it all, Taylor. Yeah. I can do it all. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, could, I can punch up any character who's um, a gay, cringe, and libtarded. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're all writing from personal experience here. <laughs> um, and, 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 like, we would love to write for this show, but we will, like, write for any show you create. We'll even create one for you, and you can just say you did it. We don't care. We just want to be involved. Let's link and build. Let's link yeah. and build. We think you're awesome. We're so glad that you've dethroned the villain Ken Olin to become the new king of TV. You rock, sir. So there you go. That's, uh, that's Tulsa King. Um, I promise Avatar is coming soon. Yeah, we will do that. We will. Once I test negative for gay, we'll do it. Yeah. (laughs)